everyone. Welcome to our meet and greet tonight at the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center. Um, we're a nonprofit organization. We're coming up on our 60th birthday next spring, so we are a tried and true organization here in Lansing. Um, we survive on having great art like this in our gallery. We have a retail gallery behind you, so please peruse that and buy some art or buy some art. Um, if you like what you see and you had a great experience, please make a donation. We have a donation box here. Um, you can donate online. You can just scan that code. Um, you can have, uh, we also offer workshops that are really fun and introductory. We also have a public art installation on the River Trail, so tonight after the show, walk down, visit Nelson Gallery. They're having a concert on the street tonight, and then go down to the river and see Art Path. You can have a whole great night in Lansing, starting with us here. Um, so I just want to welcome you. We're really glad to see you here tonight. And I hope you enjoy yourself and you come back again to the gallery to learn and explore. So I'm going to introduce Sarah Hopkins. She's our exhibition instructor. And she is going to then interview or have a nice conversation with Mike. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so yes, I am Sarah Hopkins. I am the exhibitions director here at the Lansing Art Gallery and Education Center. Um, and tonight we are here celebrating the opening reception for Mike Ross's exhibition, um, Always Different, Always the Same. Make sure I got that right. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us tonight, Mike. Um, and I also want to thank our sponsors for this exhibition, um, George Urban and Ray Ramsdahl. Thank you so much for your support and, and helping make this exhibition possible. Um, but yeah, so we can go ahead and get started with our talk. I'm definitely excited to hear more about Mike's work, and I'm sure all of you are as well. Um, so we'll start out with a Q&A portion where I will ask a series of questions, and Mike will provide some answers to those. And then at the end of the talk, if, if he wants to, um, <laughs> and then at the end of the talk, you all can also ask questions if you'd like. Um, but before I get started with my questions, I would love to give Mike an opportunity to just talk a little bit about himself and his work and this exhibition. So. Okay. So, thank you. Is it is it okay. Now it's on. Oh, yeah, I can hear. Uh, well, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you to um, local people and not so local people who have made the track. For coming out. Uh, my name is Mike Ross, and uh, obviously I painted these paintings. Um, I uh, to start with just some super basic stuff. I work a lot, obviously, with pattern and uh, repetition. Although there's less repetition in my work these days than there used to be. Um, color palette is something that's very important to me, and obviously the shapes of the canvas is something that. Um, I'm really interested in, and um, I, uh, I guess some more autobiographical information. Uh, I work out of Highland Park, uh, 333 Midland, founded by this man right here, Robert Annas, um, which uh, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary of being in that spot. It's a fantastic place. If you guys are ever in that area, please do come and visit. Uh, but being in that space has really uh, kind of helped me develop, I think, as an artist and allowed me to work very large, which I love to do, and uh, that's, uh, I think that's, that, that's about all I have for as far as that goes, so. Awesome. We don't even have to share the mic. Um, all right, awesome. So I can go ahead with my questions. Um, the first question, I always like to ask about the title of the exhibition. Um, so you're title is always different, always the same. Why did you choose this title and how does it relate to the work? So it's kind of funny. Um, for uh, some people, I know at least one person in this room who probably knows the band The Fall. Um, they had been described by the late great British DJ John Peel as their music had over their 40 year career or whatever it was. 
it was always different, always the same, essentially meaning um, you knew a false song the, the, within the first five seconds of, of hearing it, whether you'd ever heard it before or not, and whether it was from 1978 or you know 2012 or whatever. Anyway, um, I guess the, the sort of idea and the point being in the Falls work, also, there's a lot of repetition, a lot of sort of musical patterns, things like that. And um, music is definitely something that I draw a lot from. Um, I don't necessarily want to use the word inspiration, but ideas, I guess I'd, I'd more say. And um, the Falls is one of my favorite bands. And I just kind of like this idea of this, uh, it's, it's like a body of work that says, you know, um, no matter where this is coming from, and what era this is coming from, I know what this is, kind of thing. Um, and I sort of, uh, not necessarily from anyone else's perspective, which I can't speak on, but from my own, uh, to me, that's how I think of my work, sort of, is I've been doing, I've been working on variations of the theme, I guess, for as long as I've been doing it, you know. Um, I don't just, I'm not the sort of artist that's suddenly gonna, or whatever, you know. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good analogy, but maybe you know what I'm saying? Maybe. Yeah. Does no, that make I, sense? I totally, I, I get what you're saying, and I can see it now, too. I didn't know it was, uh, the title was related to, like, a musical artist, so that makes it even more interesting to me, but I definitely see what you're saying. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> So for my next question, um, in your artist statement, you say that in your latest work, you are highlighting the beauty of the medium itself, paint for paint's sake, and the plane on which it's situated. Can you expand on the concept of paint for paint's sake and what that means to you? What it means to me, I think of myself as sort of a pure painter, um, not, uh, and that's not like, you know, whatever, egotistical compassion or whatever. but. It's just that I'm, I'm working primarily, I'm interested in the medium in which I'm working, which is paint. And uh, I'm always interested in what paint can do and the different ways without using any, um, I don't know, uh, I just use brushes, you know. I, I, don't, I don't do weird things to the paint to manipulate it. I'm only using brushes, I'm only using paint. Essentially, so um, I guess that's kind of it. It's, uh, I'm, I'm I'm working with paint for paint's sake. I uh, um, yeah. I, I don't know a better way to put it. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the plane on which it's situated was the other part of the question. Um, so that's the other thing that's been interesting to me is the the shape of the canvases themselves. Um, to me, the the can the, the, the painting starts with the canvas, and there's certainly no rule that says it has to be rectangular. So, um, to me, the canvas is just as much a part of the painting as the painting itself, and they should sort of inform each other. Very well said. Thank you. Um, yeah. So many. Speaking of the unique shape of your canvases, um, many of them have a unique shape or even separate components, like this one right behind us. Um, and I, I do remember you talking a little bit about this with some folks before our talk, um, but for everyone else, um, can you share more about how you develop these concepts with the shapes of the canvas and what comes first, the shape of the canvas or the image you paint on it? Um, I, start, I almost always start with a sketch and that sketch always begins with the shape of the canvas. Um, and that can sort of develop as I'm working out the sketch and figuring out what's going to be on it, um, what the painting is going to be. I might alter some things here and there. Um, but yeah, it starts with the shape, um, which is, I'll, I would, like I say, I'll, I'll sketch it out, but then it can it end up being a little bit improvised. You know, um, as I figure out one angle, it might. It, it's not a super scientific method, so that, that angle can change the way another angle works, and then the way you know two sides will meet up, and I'll, you know, it can change a little bit, which I'm completely open to, and, and I welcome. Um, I like that sort of 
on the fly improvisation, both in the creating of the shape and in the painting itself. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to see them and wonder how you come up with the ideas. So it's, it's great to hear more about how that process happens. You kind of did already talk about like where you draw inspiration from your work with music, but are there any other sources or places that you find inspiration when just trying to come up with new ideas? Honestly, not really. Um, I'm always trying to build on whatever I've done before. So I try to keep constantly evolving. Um, it is very rare that I will walk into, say, an art museum or, or whatever um, and say, like, I want to read something that looks like that. You know, um, I guess maybe there have been one or two times where I've been like, I like that color, you know, <laughs> I'm going to steal that color or whatever. Um, but for the most part, I'm, I'm just, it's sort of a constant state of trying to perfect the, that thing that I do, and also knowing that it's never going to be perfected, which makes me happy because it means I can keep working on it forever. I love that. Um, so kind of going into more like your creative practice, which you are talking a little bit about how you generate the ideas with sketches, but um, maybe more about how, um, like where your routine when it comes to creative practice. So are you, it sounds like you're more free flowing, but do you like schedule time? Do you have certain routines that you like to create for your creative practice? Um, Just like what that looks like in general. Yeah, I generally come into the studio about five days a week and the nice thing about it is um, intentionally there's nothing else there really for me that I do. Like I don't, I don't keep like musical instruments there to play or you know, uh, I don't do other things while I'm there. So when I get there, immediately my brain, it, it's, it's kind of funny but also irritating where like I'll be in my car on the way to the studio and say I'm listening to like a radio show and I'm like, okay, as soon as I get into the studio, I have to make sure to turn on this radio so I can hear the end of the show. Literally in the 12 seconds it takes to get from my car into the studio, I've completely forgotten it because as soon as I walk in the studio door, I'm like, okay, this is what I gotta work on and I gotta do this and that. And then, you know, three hours later, I'm like, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to listen to the rest of that show. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but yeah, when I get into the studio, um, I try to work for as long as I'm there, which is usually like six to eight hours or something like that. So, and especially these days, I have a three-year-old uh, he's around here somewhere, he's upstairs. So uh, time is precious, as anyone who has kids knows. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, that does answer my question. I think it's great to hear artists who schedule out the time that they're creating work, even if within that scheduled time, it's very loose and, and uh, free-flowing, it's still, they set aside that time. So, that totally makes sense to me. Having um, a studio, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just to um, expand on that a little bit, and again, to point to uh, Robert and 333 Midland, uh, having a studio, uh, away from home for me and um, I can't speak for anyone else's experience because everyone has a different practice but for me that's been a huge part of being able to really like focus in on, on what I'm doing when I'm there you know um, I had I was working out at home for a while and it's like you know you, you want to feed the cat and whatever else is, <laughs> whatever else is going on clean the kitchen you know clean the entire house if you're stuck on something oh yeah just finding those distractions yeah mm -hmm. definitely um, yeah, and has that practice that you've kind of fallen into, uh, that routine, how, how has that changed over time? Has it always looked that way, or? Uh, more or less. Um, you know, I, I, I try not to have too many lulls in what I'm doing. Um, uh, when I'm kind of stuck on an idea of what to do, um, I'll just draw for a while, or doodle, or Whatever, that's where a lot of these little pieces on the on the post over there came from. It's just kind of, um, if I'm not in the middle of like a large piece like this that's taking up all my attention, then I'm, I'm 
you know, essentially working toward whatever the next thing is and doing sketches and doodles and stuff goes a long way towards that. Definitely. Thank you. Um, just a few more questions for me and then we can open it up for everyone else. Um, but what kinds of projects are you currently working on and um, is there something right now that you're excited about, like maybe something you're working on now or that you're kind of looking ahead towards that you're excited for? Um, well, so these big uh, diptychs <coughs> and triptychs are the most recent thing and, um, or not exactly the most recent, but they're close. Uh, but they're the most recent big thing that I've been working on. And so now I've been working on ideas to kind of expand on what is happening with these. Um, so for one, I'm going to do a few that are a little bit smaller. Um, and uh, just some different ideas. The color palette is something that I'm always thinking about. And, the thing that's kind of always evolving and I'm always trying to expand on and uh, rework and reshape. So uh, that's, that's probably my foremost uh, uh, consideration lately. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what advice would you give to someone if that wants to create something? It's not my advice, but um, I always remember a quote from uh, the artist Chuck Close, who said something along the lines of, uh, inspiration is for amateurs. <laughs> Basically, the gist of what he said. Like, you can't just sit around and wait to be inspired. You just have to do the work. And uh, I, that resonated with me completely, and uh, it's something I try to uh, hold close, you know, and uh, try to work with that in mind. And I think it's, I think it's great advice, because a lot of times, even with, you know, sometimes I'm talking to an artist who I know has been a great artist for 30 years or whatever, and they're like, eh, you know, I don't know what to do next or whatever, and it's like, you can't, you can't let yourself be bogged down by that, because then you, you, know, you get terrified of the blank canvas and whatever, you know, I, we've probably all had uh, that fear of the blank canvas kind of thing, but you just have to start throwing paint on the canvas, and even if you end up painting over all of it, that's fine. It's got you somewhere, you know. Um, so yeah, as far as advice, which I usually don't give, um, it's just keep working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's great advice, I think. Yeah, just keep working and the rest will follow. Yeah. yeah okay, last question. Um, how can everyone find out more about upcoming things? Like, where can they find? Are you on social media? Do you have a website? How can they learn more? Um, yeah, uh, all of those things. Uh, Instagram and my website, which is uh, mrossart.com. Um, that's probably the best way to find out about things. And uh, I have a little email list that I, I send out things like, you know, once a month or whatever, and to let people know what I'm up to. But Instagram is probably the best way, uh, the easiest way. So. Can you sign up for that list on your website? No, but that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> <There you> go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank that's you. That's the last question I have, but I would love for anyone who does have a question in the audience, it looks like we've got a few hands, uh, and I'll bring the mic to you. Anyway, thanks so much. This guy looks uh, like trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the form. I know you sort of talked about it at the beginning, but could you maybe give us like a biography of the form? Like, how did you come into thinking about canvas and these different shapes? How did that sort of develop? Because I mean, you almost can kind of see it here, maybe a little bit. But I was wondering if maybe you could yeah. talk a little bit about that. Ab absolutely. Um, I think a lot of it came from, um, oh yeah, this was a conversation that we were having earlier that I, I, I don't think I did touch on it when you, when you asked a, a similar question. Uh, I have always been interested in, uh, like there have been a lot of sort of geometrical shapes and things in a lot of my paintings, and at some point, I couldn't quite put my finger on when it was, but it just, I don't, even, I don't even want to say that it occurred to me, but it just sort of made sense as a logical next step to 
have the canvases echo the, some of the shapes that are happening on the canvas in the painting. I mean, um, so from there, that just kind of evolved, and then I started getting really interested in, uh, you know, it sort of culminated in, in these these big pieces where, you know, they're they look probably simpler than they are, but they're endlessly insane to build and uh, and stretch and uh, and work in that way. But you know, I, I think as a as a painter, as any kind of artist, you're constantly sort of presenting challenges to yourself and trying to figure out ways to solve those challenges. So um, yeah, I knew what I wanted to do uh, before I had quite figured out how to do it. A lot of the early shaped ones are wood because I knew I could just cut the wood with a jigsaw and frame it in the back, And uh, but I preferred painting on canvas. So eventually I figured out a way to do that as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have one here. I'm just wondering, how did you start? When, when, how did you start? When did you know you were an artist? Was it always oils? Um, yeah, it's uh, not to sound too too trite or whatever, but like you know, from the time I was I was a small kid, whatever, I always drew and painted, and I kind of kept up with that uh, for a long time, but never really took it that seriously or anything until um, I think it was probably around the time I started making music more seriously, and that just kind of. I guess opened up my mind into um, visual forms as well. And when I stopped playing a lot of music, and I still do from time to time, but when I stopped playing in bands all the time and whatever, it gave me a little bit more time to start working on the visual aspect of things. And uh, I guess it took off from there. And that was about 20 years ago, I'd say. So the drawing and then to the oils? Yeah, well, so I, I, I did study art a little bit at Oakland University in the late, mid to late 90s, um, and oil painting was like the only thing that my art instructor, Dick Goody, that's the only thing we did in those classes, which, uh, as I learned later, was kind of unusual, but it's what I learned, and I learned to, uh, I loved it from the, from the get-go, so oils have, have been pretty much my medium forever. I really love the, the, the palettes, and the one thing that I'm sort of thinking of is it seems like um, the more saturated, glossy palette's better for the smaller size, the smaller size, but like the one in the back. In my mind, I've been trying to like almost do like a Photoshop and turn up the saturation. Okay. And, you know, and it's like, it's clear that it would affect the balance. Right. But like, so I'm wondering like, what's the, the commit, like what's the decision behind picking, you know, muted, flat versus saturated, uh, glossy, because that's a big commitment, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, that's, uh, as I sort of mentioned before, the color palette is something that I'm constantly, uh, probably more than anything else, it's what I agonize over <laughs> the, the, the most. And there are certain pieces where um, uh, it, and a lot of times it's not something that I'm consciously thinking about or intending, but it, it's something that I just kind of um, say somewhere in the back of my mind where, like especially if these, like these particularly, um, I really wanted to make, since they're so large, I wanted to have them almost instill like a calm kind of thing. Um, so that was kind of what was happening with these pieces. Um, I've always been, it, like I've, I've worked with like the gradient color and everything for a long time. Um, I've always liked a sort of soft transition, I guess you'd say. Um, every once in a while you need something that's a little bit more jarring. But, um, so yeah, I like those sort of, I appreciate softness and subtlety. Uh, so that's, that's been my color palette lately. I'm curious, <clears throat> the multi-sectional pieces, is there a, uh, a uh, principle of spacing between the parts that where the visual impact is 
just right? Um, I, I think there's a subconscious one, <laughs> um, but it's just something for me anyway where I just have to look at it and say like, ah, that's too, that's too far, that's too close, you know, is it just right? Um, I wish I could describe it in more scientific yeah. terms than that, but that, that's kind of it. Do we have any other questions for Mike? So I've so um, we've been following you for a few years, and we've noticed you've done also done a lot of street art murals and things. And I was just curious about how this type of work translates into that. Do you prototype anything in the studio for that? Because that's quite different, it seems like, on a very large scale. So what's, what are the challenges with that, and how do you prepare for that? Um, well, yeah, it is a very different approach. Mostly because like the ideal situation for me is if someone says, hey, I've got a huge wall. Come and paint it. No further instructions. <laughs> um, and then uh, I can sort of work the way that I'm most comfortable working, which is with a uh, degree of improvisation, you know, um, the composition sort of, you know, I'll, I'll maybe sketch something out, but overall it kind of creates itself as it goes. Um, but with a lot of murals and, um, you know, uh, especially when they're large and expensive, people want to know what it's going to look like beforehand. So. Uh, that's something that I've kind of had to work on because that was never really part of my practice before. I was planning out a piece that fully before I started it. Um, so yeah, it's a way different approach where I'm, I've got to figure out you know exactly what colors are going to be where, and that's especially challenging for me because I work with so much gradient color and mixed paint and everything. Um, it's very rare in any of my paintings to just see a straight color just as it is out of the tube or the can. Um, so, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you. you have a couple of murals from previous years of art path, so. That's true. Up on some walls on the river trail, so. That's true. Yeah. There's one that's right down the street, like below the bridge that's. <laughs> the Shiawassee Bridge? Yeah, yeah. yeah. If um, there's one under the Shiawassee Bridge, and then there's also one under the 496 Bridge, so. Yeah. You all want to take a look at some of Mike's murals. Don't judge me on the Shiawassee one, though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I uh, had paint, started painting that one, and then the deluge of rain washed it away, and the wall was wet for, uh, I was running out of time, and I essentially had to start it and finish it in like six hours in the dark. And, uh, I've never been <laughs> It's the only piece of art that I think I've ever created where I'm like, I wish I could look over that. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? I have a quick question. It's sort of, well, it's actually not related to your work. Um, it's about Detroit. So as a former Detroiter, I want to thank you for bringing your art here to Lansing. Um, feeling out of touch from what's happening in Detroit, I was wondering if you could tell us as an artist in Detroit, how you feel that community supports local artists, and if there's anything we need to know about what's happening in Detroit to support local artists? Um, it's a, it's a, it's like the Wild West. I don't know. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of artists in Detroit. I will say that. Um, I think there, I think there is plenty of community support. Um, I don't want to use the word like clicky or anything like that, but uh, it's almost like there are pockets of communities of artists. I'm, I'm sure that happens anywhere. Um, you know, these things sort of spring up naturally. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think there. I think Detroit is a super supportive city for for artists, and there are a lot of different opportunities. Um, I think. If you're an artist in Detroit, you just have to find, and, and you want to show around a lot, and you know you want a lot of eyes on your work. You just have to find that community, or you know, hope that it finds you, or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, it's a 
It's, it's a great art city. Yeah, it is. I'm, I'm told that um, Detroit is very friendly, but also impenetrable. <coughs> People that visit, uh, sure. visit from outside. It's very hard to get your bearings in there. It is, and I think it's because and it's so... And the Annex is probably the best community gallery in Detroit. <laughs> quite a cool, and that's not me saying. I mean, I think so too. Uh, and that's not I've heard it. Oh, sorry. But it's about the only gallery that's really open to anyone to put on the show. Which gallery? Yeah, the Annex Gallery. The Annex Gallery. This is the one that Mike runs. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please come visit. <laughs> Definitely going to have to. We have our, as, as I think I mentioned, we have our 10 year show coming up in August. I think the opening is August 10th, if memory serves. So that's just a month away. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> That's my wife, Christine. The marketer. <laughs> Do any any last questions before we wrap things up? All right. Awesome. Well, thank nice. you, Mike. Oh well, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for our presentation. Really appreciate it. So we can't do it without the artists, so. And, and the artists can't do it without you. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> always but yes, thank you. And yeah, definitely enjoy the, the work in the show. Talk with Mike, get some refreshments upstairs, and shop our retail gallery, and enjoy. Thank you.